All right. Um, so in this second session, um, we're going to be thinking about and looking at technology and innovation, and in particular, the role um, uh, that they play in the gray area of taxation that we are struggling to sort of both contain, define, understand, and respond to. Um, and I'm hoping that we can be looking at how in that advancements in technology uh, may be shaping the roles, the responsibilities, and the practices of tax professionals who really are the heart of our inquiry um, today. And also to think about the influence of artificial intelligence on gray area tax operations um, and the potential uh, for tax professionals to, to use, to leverage innovations, uh, perhaps AI, machine learning, um, as they navigate and or exploit gray areas um, and sort of what are the ethical considerations um, and any implications really for accountability um, as we see technology play a greater role. Now, as I mentioned, a, a number of our um, observations and comments in the prior session, I think really brought in and sort of foreshadowed uh, thinking about technology, um, some positive, some perhaps not positive, um, but really what I'm hoping that we can do in this, uh, this round is really focus uh, more to that um, more to that specific question. Uh, and so I thought again, once I'd start with a, a bit of a broader uh, a broader um, launch um, and ask from your experience perspective or maybe your uh, assessment of where you see us headed, uh, the ways in which kind of specific ways in which uh, advancements in technology and uh, digital innovation, are in fact shaping the roles, shaping what tax professionals do, particularly in the gray area, right? Uh, is it changing their approach to interpretation? Is it helping them or changing how they deal with ambiguity in tax law, provide advice? What are you seeing? What are you imagining um, that space starting to look like? Shall I go first, Diane? Absolutely. Dive right in. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I, I'm not a tax professional, um, but I used to be a, a criminal defense lawyer um, working in fraud and, and white collar crime. So I've sort of seen it from the, uh, you know, from the side of um, when things go wrong, shall we say, or or when people um, are uh, naughty. Uh, putting it mildly um and um although it's been a while since i've worked in criminal defense uh, since then i've worked in um in legal technology i suppose from from my point of view um what i see is the importance of um of data and uh, artificial intelligence in reviewing that data now um a quick scan around the world of of uh, tax advisory will give you various uh, comments by by big four firms and others that um in actual fact they're using ai as a tool alongside human beings so there's no suggestion of kind of tax advice being done at that level um by by um by robots by by artificial intelligence um so tax advisors are using um you know are using a tool um and they're using it in conjunction with their own with their own understanding and of course um, tax advisors are going to be liable for their um, for their advice, which of course their clients are going to are going to rely on. Um, perhaps what's more interesting from my point of view is, is is two aspects. One is where you know private individuals or businesses rely on um, uh, programs that that um, suggest that they can offer you know tax advice, and they rely on those, and they you know and they're and they're wrong, or perhaps the you know the data is wrong. What happens there? Um, and also on the sort of on the you know on the on the prosecution um, of you know tax fraud side fraud side where um, prosecuting authorities for example the serious fraud office in the UK um, are already using um, artificial intelligence particularly um, in the in the realm uh, of disclosure so I think there's some you know some interesting things uh, going on it's very hard at the moment to see that you know, we're quickly going to get to a stage where any reputable, you know, business is going to purely rely on the press of a button um, or indeed, um, you know, any any 
prosecuting authority is going to rely on the on the press of a button to you know you know to get there. Um, one thing, it, 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 in my view, that that's kind of the the current situation shows is that there's still um, a, you know a reluctance to rely on artificial intelligence from you know from what I can see in the in in, in the in the industry um but all but also it shows how important having data that's that's i guess clean and that's in a good state in the first place is um so you know we you couldn't be using you know even the most advanced AI, ai if you've got a bunch of you know cigarette packets and uh and bits of receipts um uh knocking around um but I think we eventually we'll get to a stage where we will have defendants, for example, in criminal proceedings, who will say, "Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I relied on a bit of technology to to give me tax advice, um, and it gave me this advice, um, and you know, I did, you know, X, Y, and Z, and now I'm being told I'm, you know, I'm I'm criminal for it, um, and I think that's when it drifts into, you know, the the ethical side, which I know we've already touched on, is, you know, to what extent can you kind of abrogate your own um, you know, ethical responsibilities to, uh, you know, legal responsibilities um, by saying that I relied on, you know, pressing that button. Um, so I suppose all I've really done there is ask a few questions. I haven't given any answers, as, but I thought it'd be a start. Uh, no, absolutely. Well, also, I mean, I'd say you've highlighted, I think, you know, I asked the question about tax advisors and I kind of want to stay with that for a moment, but I think it's important to bring in the government side. We'll be picking that because it's really on both. Um, and, you know, we may be thinking primarily about tax advisors playing an active role, um, but there is an entire industry of sort of tax advisors behind the scenes preparing software that then becomes the only interface really with the client. And that's not the typically the high end big dollar client, but it's also going to be part of the landscape we see going forward. Uh, Paul, turn to you next. Hey, thanks. Um... A, a couple of thoughts um, along similar lines. Thinking about the, the gray area, we've been talking about it in, in terms of where do advisors sit in that gray area. I'm, I've also been thinking about it as we've been talking as a murky area in which things can be hidden or where things are not apparent. And in a world awash with data, which our world is now, I think the number of places you can hide is rapidly reducing. So pretty much every tax authority in the world now, I think the last OECD survey said 98% of tax authorities are using data analytics and 72% are already either using artificial intelligence or thinking about using artificial intelligence. Tax authorities understand the value of all that data that data that's out there and a number of places to hide things because of that um, abundance of data is reducing so there are two ways tax authorities can think about doing this in a reactive way let's discover bank accounts let's discover assets um, and there are plenty of examples or in a more, more proactive way um, using predictive ai so I think advisors have to be very aware of how that has shifted. But there's one big question at the end of it. We can do an enormous amount with technology to shine a light into gray areas, but there's a price tag on that. What's the price tag we're actually willing to pick up to allow the technology to do what it's capable of? And, and the, the second set of thoughts really come around artificial intelligence, and I'm sure we're going to explore this much more between us over the coming minutes. But I think generative AI has emerged onto the scene over the last year in pretty spectacular fashion. It's a game changer from machine learning to generative AI is just a huge leap. And I've done some work on, on this and tried to look at the effect on tax, tax advisory work. How powerful a tool is generative AI for someone who doesn't use a tax advisor? And how powerful a tool is it for a deep subject expert? And the answer is at the moment, it's early days. And I, I think it comes back to some of those questions that, that we've just had. Where does responsibility lie? 
if you're an unrepresented taxpayer, what constitutes reasonable care? Just pumping in a question and getting an answer. How far should you rely on that? How far should you kick the tires? When you're a qualified professional, that standard or that the bar is raised, I think, enormously. So you come down to this question that I think is at the heart of generative AI, black box versus transparent box. How much do we just rely on the answer that comes out? And how much do we need to know about the process that goes behind it? And I think that takes us down some very interesting routes in, in, indeed. But if I pull all that to a conclusion, I think the skills for tax professionals that are really going to matter in a world of generative AI and, and big data are good old fashioned professional skills that I was taught 40 years ago when I started training. Professional judgment, knowing how to kick the tires, getting a sense of right and wrong, getting a sense of when something isn't quite the way it should be. Those skills and ethical skills I think are going to be right at the heart for the next generation of tax professionals, even though they'll live in a, a digital world that looks very different. Thank you, Paul. I, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of points you raised because I think they, they flow nicely. So one is that uh, you made an observation about the gray area being gray in different ways. It's gray by virtue of being hidden and kind of not quite a lot of light being shown there, so maybe it's easy to hide things. Um, and also the possibility gray in the sense of foggy, unclear, even if everything was laid out, there's still lack of agreement on exactly sort of where we are in the tax world on that. So that I thought was very helpful. I just wanted to highlight that for people. Um, and, and your point about uh, uh, governments long, you know, relying on uh, AI, um, you know, within the past couple of weeks, the IRS had announced um, in the U.S. that they were relying on artificial intelligence to deal with uh, complex uh, partnerships, which have always been among our most challenging taxpayers uh, for the IRS to audit. It requires a significant level of technical expertise. Um, and that also requires resources of having that kind of expertise that people have to be around for a while, um, budget cuts, et cetera. So uh, they've sort of brought in the tech a little bit to try to be part of that bridge going forward um, to be more successful. Um, so again, sort of that same story. And then the last thing I was thinking about as you were talking about what is required of the advisors in this world uh, where technology will play, if not a clear role yet, a certainly a powerful role. And the sort of uh, dominant thread of sort of ABA expectations, American Bar Association expectations, say for lawyers, uh, it, um, is that you keep up with technology, right? I mean, that is actually part of your duty as a lawyer to keep up. It does not require you to have, a, you know, uh, the expertise of an MIT grad in designing AI, no, uh, but to be a, a reasonably knowledgeable user of any technology you are bringing to bear with your own personal expertise. So exactly, uh, Paul, you really captured that. Um, Maria Amparo, I'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, I uh, was thinking about the gray areas and in fact, I would say that we have two layers of gray areas, one uh, in taxation and the other in technology, because uh, many of these techniques uh, and technological means are not accurate enough to help yet. Uh, so they are gaining a lot of popularity, but uh, they have limited application. So uh, I think tax professionals, for what I've seen uh, from a theoretical perspective in my uh, literature review here uh, while being at Northwestern as visiting professor, is that uh, there is a lot of debate on how to be efficient, how to be effective, but at the same time, there's always this race uh, because uh, we all know that tax uh, legislation uh, changes so uh, relatively quickly as compared to other branches of law. And also uh, technology is uh, growing and evolving at a very uh, quick pace. So I think tax professionals feel uh, both grace. And uh, in that uh, 
uh, context is uh, difficult. Uh, yeah, you have to be diligent, uh, but sometimes can you afford the newest uh, technology? And uh, if not, uh, then you cannot compete uh, in the environment, in the current environment. So uh, just to make uh, this short point, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Sidesh. Yeah, uh, just to uh, to just to reemphasize and on front of some of the points which Paul raised is uh, we have to look at the technology from uh, how game changer is going to be just from the perspective of governments. What the current traditional government is, it's you have a tax advisor or a company which provide the data or give out the tax returns. And as a as a tax officer, you verify the information. And now we have a game changing technologies like AI, blockchain, data analytics. So it's going to completely change. So what we have currently now is, is tax authority is a is a verifier of an outcome. That outcome is is what you what the taxpayer submits to the to the government. But in future with this technology, the government has to be a tax verifier of the systems. So it's completely changes now. We now the tax authority relies on the on the information, but in the future the goalpost will change from the information to verifying the systems. So in case in tax authority finds that the systems of the taxpayer they are producing proper outputs, then the tax authority will not even look at the outputs that they are there. So the the goalpost will be changing that whether the systems are actually giving out the correct answers or not. So that is the first, the government will not be the verifier of outcomes, but it will be the verifier of the systems. Uh, the second point, which I think is maybe in terms of internationally, what is happening, exchange of information. Uh, in international, if you see, we have this exchange of information on the request, automatic exchange of information, though it's called as automatic, it's not technically or being automatic, which has in, 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 a, in a traditional way, it has been one government requests another government or one local agency request another agency that give me the information of a particular taxpayer. With the advent of the technology like artificial intelligence, we will be moving away from, from instead of pull that we request, it will be more like a push. So the governments will be automatically feeded with the information without even asking. So this will be a, 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 a complete different change of what we used to happen. Third, and, and it is something maybe perhaps uh, 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 people from the big four will be knowing more the use of blockchain and how blockchain can can and completely get, be a game changer in the in, in this situation. Like for example, just to have a, uh, to give an example of uh, if you have a uh, when you have a cross border trans transaction to claim the benefit of the treaty, you need to have this tax treaty certificate that you are a resident of a particular country or not. And now, with the help of blockchain, and where there are systems which are being invented that a uh, taxpayer don't even need to submit that certificate, or tax authority will verify based on the on a blockchain where the residency certificate of a taxpayer is being stored so that in the scandals which we see that a person who is fraudly generating fraudly like a tax residency certificate which is not genuine but for claiming the tax duty benefit it's submitting and all those fraud being done with the tax other all those frauds will be el eliminated with the help of the technology like blockchain where you cannot edit those certificates or where you cannot submit the fraudulent documents. So it's when we look at those things, we have to see that it's not will be the traditional tax authority as it before, who is deals with the paper, who who asks for the information or, or who is more of taking and looking at your tax return data, but it will be other way around. So we need to think from the different and, and, and maybe on the on the on the last and maybe funny perspective. Well, I think when you said a tax advisor using artificial intelligence, government is also using artificial. So both two artificial intelligence competing against each other, one from the government, one from the taxpayer. So which artificial intelligence wins? This is just a, a thought to think about. But uh, yeah, this is something I think about for the future.
Thank you. Diane, may I? Because I got a few things. Sure. To say. Uh, so but sure, and then I'll jump to yes, and then I'll jump to Paul. Thank if you. If I if I can, uh, I think I see the focus, the the point. Uh, let me go through. I've got two things to say about the technology and uh, certain things about the present, certain things about the future. Let's talk about the present and uh, let's talk about what happens now. And let's go back to transfer pricing. If I send my, uh, if I fill to the uh, tax authority my transfer pricing documentation, I can ask, I can claim for the penalty protection. Nowadays, we have uh, in Italy, around Europe, the cooperative compliance. So I share my information with tax authority so I can claim for a, a, a reduction, concrete reduction of penalties. Let's go back to what happens in the next future. Blockchain as the infrastructure. The problem we have got right now is the amount of data, the amount, it's not just data, the amount of information. Let's think about the loopholes about the mandatory the DAX 6, for instance, is not just a data, it's, an, it's a complex information. The point is that blockchain will, could help as an infrastructure to uh, work all this information and give an output. And as you may know, the problem is the quality of data, but this is a technological problem. Let's go back to that. I want to go back to, and so what could happen With, within the next few years, I think, uh, the tax authority, let's uh, let's go back after with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a complete game changer also in terms of uh, right and duties of the taxpayer because we are we are moving from a system, from a legal system based on the self-assessment from the taxpayer to another system where the, the tax form, would be would be the government to send the tax form to the taxpayer and the taxpayer may accept it or not. So if you think to this, you can understand that everything is going to change. And of course, also the rule of the tax advisor is going to change. The tax advisor, since today, I mean, I'm talking about the physiological rule, not about the pathological rules, because that depends also on the values, on the culture, and on the ethical of my colleagues. But the point is that we are becoming more and more advisor of risk management instead of uh, uh, looking for uh, efficient taxation. The right to the bottom, the rise to the bottom has over. And what I think is that more and more uh, we need to our rules would be the one to try to represent the real situation to the tax authority that may ask us, may ask the taxpayer a certain amount of taxes uh, coming from the da data it has uh, used, analyzed, but our rule would be the one to explain the real situation that may be the same or different. The point is, uh, what must be understand is that what came out from the blockchain, from the artificial intelligence, is not the truth. It's just an, an information, but could not be the reality. Otherwise, the risk of Orwell 1984 is just uh, over the door. Uh, Paul, I I'll turn to you and then Don. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, a couple of things from what, what you said, Sidesh, um, really struck me. Nobody's mentioned Tax Administration 3.0, the 2020 OECD paper that looks at the, the future of digital tax administration. One of the fundamental concepts in Tax Administration 3.0 is compliance by design. So building tax rules into taxpayers' natural systems, into software, in, into ERP systems. That, I think, leads straight into Sidesh's point about audit. If tax authorities are managing to get compliance rules built into software, into technology, 
their interest is going to be more in how effectively those systems are working than perhaps in, in the data itself. So I think there's a big transformation coming there. I think there are huge issues for advisors and for taxpayers there. Um, building in some compliance rules would be very non-contentious. Building in others would be massively contentious. And I think we've got yet another grey area in between those two extremes, but it's one that as a tax profession, as a legal profession, I think, and, and as citizens, we've got to be very aware of. It could very easily be at the thin end of a very thick wedge. Um, something else that Sidesh mentioned was um, blockchain and the common reporting standard. So under the common reporting standard, we've got what over 100 jurisdictions exchanging information. Great, that's shining light into some gray areas, but it's actually being done by, I think over 4,000 bilateral agreements. Wouldn't it be great if you could store that information in a blockchain, a permission blockchain, so that you got away from that administrative mess of 4,000-odd bilateral agreements into something that was technologically based, where trust was just built into to the blockchain? And then Daniel also picked up on the, the blockchain point. Uh, transfer pricing is one clear use in tax, um, but I think it, it also takes us on to some other things that again, we need to be aware of as issues of, of principle. If we move into a world of more automated decisions within tax, perhaps tax appeals, the algorithm rhythms behind those automated decision-making processes need to be transparent and that takes us back to an, an issue we explored in the first session this afternoon, opacity and transparency. There are some massive issues here. I could happily talk about it all night, but I promise you I won't. I'll shut up now. Well, I will go to Don, but please pop your hand up again uh, because it's all quite interesting. Don, to you. Oh, just to be brief, I'm I'm fascinated by this line of um, inquiry, but to me, um, what and resonates in my mind is what is the societal impact on something as, I don't want to say as simple, but as basic as sustainability. Uh, there was just a research report um, issued this week out of the Netherlands that suggests that perhaps um, when Google's ready to integrate uh, AI in its browsers, it will take as much energy as it takes to fuel the entire country of Ireland. Um, so when we're talking about these massive global systems, there's a significant environmental impact of doing this, and it's a cost on societies um, across the globe. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I actually just kind of wanted to, to take a slightly different tack. So, so far, um, I think a number of our observations and um, explorations of both where, where we see the tax system and where we see it headed in the sort of uh, short, medium, and slightly longer term uh, have been rather positive in terms of the ways in which technology, uh, uh, environment aside, very important point, Don, uh, may improve uh, compliance, may improve the government's ability uh, to audit, may streamline um, those processes. Um, I want to ask about the, the flip side. Uh, you know, I'm the tax advisor. Um, I want to do the best for my clients. Best is a broad amorphous concept. Uh, how do you see, um, say, predictive analysis, uh, AI-led risk assessment, or other uses of um, these new developments uh, playing a role in the tax advisor's, you know, ability to navigate the gray space to the maximum? So not, not navigate and comply and document easily, but navigate and reduce tax. Uh, Christopher. Um, oh, it, it's, it's, it's Chris, please don't, don't, um, I don't use Absolutely. my full name very much. <laughs> um, re really, really quick point, And it was uh, following up on what Paul was talking about before, actually, which is about the, um, uh, well, what he said initially, which is, which was about the, um, the approach taken by a tax advisor, you know, the, 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 
um using your knowledge as a tax advisor to to understand what it is that the technology does and um you know this this idea that you've got to as a tax advisor or a lawyer got to be competent in using that technology now i i for example teach my students that they should always have a kind of critical approach to any technology so i'm never going to say you know just accept the technology but make sure you understand it and make sure you've take a critical approach to it so um from a point of view from an ad, for an advisor who's in my view for an advisor who's who's advising around that gray area and trying to do their best for their clients if they're using technology it's it's beholden upon them to you know to have those skills those sort of critical analytical skills not just in terms of what it is that they're doing around the law of tax but also to understand what the technology can do and what it can't do um which sounds like a bit of um i guess like a bit of a cop out from my point of view but but i suppose what i'm trying to say is that the responsibility you know for all the technology that we're going to talk about the responsibility lies very much with you know with the advisor and that kind of you know as paul said those you know those skills that they should have um again i know less about obviously you know tax advisory but it would be the same, I would think, in terms of you know lawyers advising around the 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 grey area of you know of, of anything legal. Um, so don't use technology if you don't understand it, and if you do use it, make sure you go to it with a very kind of critical approach and use it you know in your in your in your client's interests so far as you're morally and ethically able to. Thank you, Amparo. Yeah, I I think uh, one important issue here at stake is how uh, tax advisors explain to their clients what they are able to do in tax terms and in technology terms. Uh, to explain in an understandable manner, uh, which is the role of AI being used in their advice and also get the consent because maybe their data are, gonna to be, are going to be used uh, to train models uh, for a more specific legal uh, advice in the future. So uh, one thing I th believe should be clearly stressed in one, if one is to be honest with the taxpayer is to explain uh, the capabilities and communicate well if uh, there are any changes. Because uh, I was uh, concerned, as Paul said before, uh, with uh, the situation of the tax systems, the tax authorities and taxpayers' rights. Uh, but uh, we don't really pay attention to the relation uh, between attorney and client in these matters. And this also is important for taxpayers. And what can the taxpayer do as a client if they are going to seek advice in another uh, consultant and then they have outputs that they have uh, received from a previous firm? Uh, so at the end, I believe uh, human oversight and human responsibility is a must. And uh, you may even need uh, an insurance policy. Uh, so uh, that's also a, an issue to pay attention. Uh, thank you. Carla. Yes, thank you. I'd like to chime in um, my observation and agree that and concur with all the observations shared by Maria and especially Paul at the beginning that speak to professionals um, applying their professional skepticism. End of the day, we live in a world where we, um, we're we not divorced from technological advances. We live in a world that now it's almost borderless apart from uh, jurisdictional uh, idiosyncrasies. And the fact that we now have um, access to technology for greater collaboration, obviously it's a double-edged sword. Uh, while it allows for professionals to get together and be able to share ideas and collaborate and pose questions. There's also opportunities for abuses um, for those who are much more at with technological advances. So um, in terms of professional encounters per our code, we clearly state that you 
have to keep up with your professional development. It's very important that while you're carrying out your ethical obligation in carrying out tax uh, provisioning services that you be aware where you are lacking in expertise in areas and be able to collaborate. And, and let's not forget that we're all professionals. We have to go through a certain amount of education. We have to take certifications and annually keep up with our professional development. While we're aware, we've heard from, from some jurisdiction where a tax preparer don't have to be qualified per se, but most of us um, tax professionals around the world globally do belong to a certain professional conduct where we very much are proud um, that we uphold a very high ethical bar. And hence, I, my personal view is, while we are aware of some of the uncertainties, we come with technology advances, but it also poses great opportunity for us to co collaborate and be able to make things work better for everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Sadesh. Yeah, uh, just two points on uh, how technology can be used for uh, perhaps for not for the purpose of tax compliance, but for abuse. Uh, I think one of the examples and which is now a headache of many governments worldwide is cryptocurrencies. Yeah, cryptocurrencies can be used also for conduit for tax evasion and because the way they are decentralized and offer they are anonymous. So as a tool, cryptocurrencies could be a problem for for uh, as a way of technology which is used for rather than the purpose of for the for tax compliance but for tax abuse second is we are talking about many tools like ai blockchain or data analytics but one thing which i think it was also a, a part of the discussion of the of the previous session is what what we need to uh, also think about is uh, cyber security and data integrity yeah, many of like there was this big leak, well, like uh, the leakage in, in Bulgaria, like Bulgarian tax system was hacked. And uh, then what if the the data is uh, with the hands of the, the the hackers and then they demand and which is demand the money is basically a uh, 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 lifeblood of the country on which all the revenue is being generated. But imagine if those systems are under the wrong hand and it gets hacked. So these are, I think, two of the things I think which we also need to be aware about when we talk about technology. Thank you. Um, and I just kind of wanted to tie together because a number, you know, I had sort of asked a question a, a bit about sort of uh, how we may find uh, tax professionals um, using technology to sort of enhance, expand the gray, gray area uh, to the benefit of clients. But a number of you um, raised some really interesting related points just about the ethical obligations overall that are really uh, shaping tax professionals' engagement with technology going forward. And I just want to make sure we distilled that together because we're talking about sort of being clear with your clients, right? First of all, about how your data is being used, having consent, having clarity. Uh, and I think that's driving what we're seeing a number, particularly the big four, uh, creating their own proprietary systems so that in fact the, the data is more protected, is not going to be uh, sent out more broadly and, and uh, being part of a system they don't control. Um, also issues about expertise. I loved insurance. Absolutely. I'm sure front and center is just another new risk. Um, and the point about collaboration, again, you do need, it, even where you're not an expert, you can't be an expert in everything, but then you go and get that expertise. But that again raises in, you know issues about being clear on how you're sharing information and all of the uh, data security that comes along with that. I uh, just want to throw into that, um, you know, the risks of manipulating the data, uh, or the system itself. Um, we've talked sort of about, you know, understanding it or having data stolen. Um, also prospects of manipulation of either uh, without that being absolutely obvious. Um, all right, so uh, Meredith, I wanna turn to you. Thinking a little bit more outside of the box about um, the way that technology is being used today. Um, we're seeing a greater use of things like telehealth and um, supports that can be given to people who are um, in need of say emotional support or psycho psychosocial support as they go through difficult periods. And as we know that whistleblowing is um, as much as it has consequences on people's professional careers, it also has very serious consequences on people's um, uh, 
emotional health, physical health, psychological health, and the extent to which there can be uh, different kinds of technologies, uh, webinars, trainings, and different uh, online supports that can be given to people um, to support them throughout the process from the beginning, from when the people might be considering whether uh, throughout the intense period, and then even the long-term effects. So um, I think technology has a role to play there, um, especially as things we people become more uh, comfortable with, uh, you know, interacting with, uh, say, uh, counseling professionals or even spiritual care prof professionals online. Um, that could be a really strong resource that can help to bring forward the opportunities for whistleblowing. Thank you, Meredith. A nice way to sort of pair kind of our first panel, our second panel, and ultimately our third. Uh, Paul. Just very, very briefly, could I just pick up your point on, on, on manipulation? I recently saw what I thought was a fantastic piece of software, which I thought if the business that was using that software ever had a tax inquiry would provide really solid evidence. And I talked to an old friend who is a retired tax investigator from the UK Tax Authority about it. And he just smiled and said, when you started training, Paul, do you remember the old joke about having three sets of accounts, one for the client, one for the bank and one for the tax authority? And he said, that's exactly what you do here. If you really wanted to cheat the tax authority, you just have two copies of the data. And that was a thought that I've been reflecting on ever since. And I, I think it comes back to the core st skills are still important. Professional judgment, a sense of scale, a sense of what's right and what's wrong. But actually, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The old tricks still work. And if you really want to cheat on a piece of technology, somebody will probably find a way to do it. I might hesitate over saying that about blockchain, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who's thinking about it right now. So I see a, a great future for technology in tax compliance. I see it as shining a light into some dark corners, but I'm under no illusion that it comes down to what we're prepared to pay for and accepting that the old skills still count and accepting that no matter how good it is, somebody will still try to cheat the system. Diane, may I? Just Absolutely. Uh, I totally agree with what Paul was saying now, right now. And I was thinking, uh, consider what happens today with transfer pricing and benchmark. The tax authority says something, you say something else. Tomorrow, with technology, could happen the same thing, not just about the transfer pricing, but the all income. So that's why I go back to my personal um, uh, valuable idea of the importance of global minimum tax. Whatever you do is not important. What is important that you pay a certain amount of tax in each country. I think that that is the real efficient way to fight against the race to the bottom. Thank you. Uh, Amparo and then Walter. Thank you, Diane. Uh, this uh, last intervention uh, by Daniel has brought my attention to a comment uh, I received in discussion uh, at the University of Utrecht uh, course uh, a couple of weeks ago with a person who had a real problem uh, with uh, transfer pricing uh, with a bananas plantation in Costa Rica where uh, the transfer pricing uh, that uh, was traditionally uh, calculated was being uh, beaten by uh, the tax authorities using uh, AI. And uh, the situation that uh, the, the tax advisors and the taxpayer were put because they couldn't uh, easily fight 
against uh, that uh, lack of comparables and how uh, it had been uh, calculated. So it's not a tomorrow, it, it's happening. And uh, yeah, uh, I fully agree that we need uh, to be cautious uh, with uh, this type of instruments. Thank you. A voter and then Susan. Good. I'm uh, Diane. Sorry for throwing in a a curveball here in the into the session, but coming from a background of uh, um, implementing technical solutions for tax and for accounting, I see a world that is diverging extremely. On the one hand side, you got the rule based world, and you got the financial transactions, and I see more and more countries implementing processes where every invoice even prior to being sent out or received should be passed by the local tax authority well if you combine all invoices and all payroll you know it becomes very difficult to cheat if the local tax authority has that you know you got your incoming invoices you got your outgoing invoice you got your payroll what else that you have that you can follow with if the other side has all that data so that is the day-to-day -day transactional world, and you got data mining tricks, you got fraud detection, you got compliance software on top of it. That's where the world is going to, and, and I'm surprised. I mean, this started in the, in, in Scandinavia and the Nordics, uh, but now I've even helped implement this in Saudi Arabia of all countries, who just implemented VAT for the first time, but they want outgoing invoices to be passed. Now again, you got the other side of the world because this is on a country by country and on a transactional basis. But you got the basic principles, not the rule based world, you got the principle based world. And that's where I see the tax advisors going into, you know, the strategy and the tactics, you know, what is substance? Uh, what is a resident of a certain country? Yeah, uh, where does ownership go? At what point in time? I see timing differences. That's where legislators build principles, big picture stories, but they're not concrete enough to change into rules. And by the way, um, AI is a great tool if you want to compare various legislation pieces in various countries, but that assumes that all the legislation is complete, accurate and published, uh, which in the international world is not. So I see a huge new world coming for tax advisors on international advice, on principle-based advice, because the legislators are vague and they are vague on purpose, yeah? because the transactional world is arriving arriving very fast and there is gonna be competitiveness between, between countries, for sure, shopping for the, the lowest end, right? Sorry, just throwing it in. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan. Sure. Well, and I just would pick up on the point that there are people with this full range of technological capabilities. And I think it brings me back to what Carla said, that often you're working with other people and you may or may not be familiar with just how competent they are in this area. And I think it was best illustrated with this recent case out of New York involving chat GBT and that the lawyers were working in a team and unbeknownst to some of them, one of the team members was using chat GBT without knowing its limitations. And after the court became aware of it, all of the lawyers basically had to respond to the court's um, intention to sanction them all. And so what does that mean in terms of working in groups and working in teams? I think it brings home something that we often forget about is this issue of peer review, the extent to which basically we are our brothers and sisters keepers. And should we be engaging more due diligence when it comes comes to understanding the um, knowledge and skills of the people with whom we work. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, that was a, a, a painful case to watch unfold. Philippa. Yes, I've been moved um, from Paul's talking about the old fashioned, you know, values and, and ways of teaching. And now that Susan spoke, I can't help but say that 
even chat GPT only goes up to about two, at, at least the model that most people are using here in the law school to about 2021. So there's like two years that you don't have any information and that you're not getting. And so many people even using Lexis or Westlaw or any, any um, databases don't realize what's actually contained in the database. You know, it's so different than looking at a book or something that you can look at cover to cover. So I think that that due diligence and those old fashioned values of critical thinking are even more important as we move more into technology. Thank you. Uh, so two questions I wanted to raise, one really quick and then the other to kind of close us out. The quick one is we've talked uh, uh, and identified a range of sort of technologies uh, that may bear on tax practice, tax compliance, tax enforcement uh, going forward. Uh, but you often hear people bandy about the metaverse. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to define it as it has actually vague and many definitions. Uh, but I was just curious whether any of you uh, have any reaction to uh, the prospect of the metaverse uh, in tax going forward. We should talk about ours. So, I mean, we need another session about the, but consider that uh, on my personal opinion, it's a kind of fourth dimension of the market. And so if you produce ability value over there and this value became ability to pay within the real market, the real economy, you should pay taxes on uh, you should pay taxes on the ability to pay consider what happened in italy for instance about crypto asset with the new law the new law approved uh, last year so the budget law of 2023 if you change crypto asset with crypto asset you don't pay taxes on capital gain because as you say in las vegas was is in vegas stay in vegas until you don't have that value, don't create value in the real world, you don't pay taxes. And this is something more or less that could happen in the metaverse. The point is that is still is there, there is already an economy, but it's still a kind of an experiment. So we should talk about that in next okay, in, in an occasion, if possible. Great. Just wanted to give it its air here. Uh I will then bring us to the sort of the last question. And actually, Walter, you sort of did your own answer to this before I even asked it, um, which was um, as you're standing here now and looking sort of to the future of the tax profession in light of AI, in light of the kinds of technologies we've talked about, um, particularly for uh, those operating in the gray area, what do you see? If you sort of just had to kind of sum up the future as you see it, um, are there a few key points that you would kind of want to close out this panel on, things you want us to be thinking about? The last one, and then I go. Right off the fence. What is important in the next few uh, years, within uh, in facing more powerful tax administration, what is important is the value of the information of the of the tax administration, the, or the burden of talking about the burden of proof. So the tax authority has got an information which is the value of this information, which are the instrument uh, the taxpayer has to show the country, like the, in the example of Costa Rica. Uh, so right of the fence, and uh, again uh, preparing. I mean, as a tax advisor, that this is what I'm saying also to my colleagues preparing to this game changer, preparing not to the self-assessment of the field of the declaration, but preparing to negotiate with the tax authority the value of the declaration they feel. So everything is going to change. But in Italy, with the Gatto Pardo, we say, when everything changes, nothing really changes. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, just some very brief thoughts and really just bringing together some of the things that we we've covered this afternoon or this morning um there are technology is going to pose huge challenges 
but actually technology has already changed tax compliance over the last 25 years. Um, we've moved from a world of bits of paper into electronic forms, largely. We're now moving beyond forms into a world of data and the need to structure that data and to interrogate it and to do interesting things with it. We're moving from a world of periodic data into a world of real-time data. Um, there will be technology challenges. What skills are we all going to need? Do we train technologists up in tax or do we train who know about tax and technology? The answer is probably a hybrid, but who knows? We could debate that for an hour. But I still think that at the heart of it, the traditional skills are going to be the most important ones. Ethics, having a sense of proportion, knowing when an answer looks right and when an answer looks wrong, transparency and opacity in the world of AI, in a world of automated decision making, those two words are going to be absolutely critical. Tax authorities are going to want automated decision making processes. Why would they want to deal with huge numbers of appeals by putting a human being at a desk anymore? But as a profession with a responsibility to clients, we have to understand the processes that are being automated. We have to be ready to ask the questions. And in the world envisaged by Tax Administration 3.0 of compliance by design, we also have to be very aware of what rules are being incorporated where, whether they're the right rules, whether they're the wrong rules, and making sure that if we've got it wrong, there's a way of challenging. So uh, I think all of those things are actually traditional skills. They're skills that I've seen in the profession over the last four decades, and they were there in the four decades before. I think they're gonna be just as important in the next four decades, but they'll be applied in a very different landscape. I'm an optimist, having said all that, I think it's gonna be exciting times. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Carla. Hi, uh, yes, um, to sum up the discussion from theme number one and currently and what we've heard floated around in um, from the two sessions, we heard a lot about public interest or concern with technological advances is how government have a role to play in dealing with some of these tax abuses versus tax compliance. Another thing as a profession, I think it's quite important to remember that we also need to educate the general public, especially with the movement towards ESG where there's much more scrutiny of society upon tax professionals of a certain strategy that we should undertake. And if we do encourage tax transparency, will that encourage um, better uh, engagement with the society in terms of organizations wanting to do good, or will that encourage um, organization to undertake, for example, practices such as greenwashing, so it's something that we really need to think about. While technology is a big ticket item, I think the one that is unpredictable and out of our control of everyone is how society will perceive some of these practices. And while we can have great systems and collaboration and discussions around table, and yet if the general public don't even really understand what the, the general issues, um, then you know that was something that we really need to think about. Great, thank you very much. Um, this has been wonderful, uh, at no surprise. Uh, so what I'd like to do is take a, a five minute break, absolutely no more, uh, come back just five minutes before the hour and we will start our third and final panel. So uh, thank you and I'll see you literally in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm.